Hello, it is just me, Tiny Tasha, or you can call me Tasha like everyone else does. Hello. I don't know what that was. <laughs> I'm actually really nervous but also excited to do this video. Today, as you can see, we are going to be doing something very different. My, my setup's slightly different. There's a lot going on. I have been watching loads of other YouTubers do this, especially one of my favourite YouTubers is Bailey Serian, who does Murder Mystery and Makeup Mondays. So shout out to her. She's not gonna see this, but yeah, massive fan of hers. And I listen to a bunch of podcasts, read loads of books and stuff, and I was just like, it's something that I'm genuinely passionate about. I love makeup as well, and I'm gonna give it a go of doing like a serial killer on a Sunday. Um, see obviously where it goes. Something a little bit different, you know, if you're not really interested, that's, that's cool. But it's most definitely my thing. So today I'm gonna basically tell you about a unsolved murder while I do my makeup. I'm going for a green vibe today and I'm gonna be mainly using the Jaclyn Hill Dark Magic Palette, which I can show you. I'm just gonna get going with it really. So this unsolved group of murders have bothered me for a while. As soon as I first heard about them, it's been bothering me. And I thought I'd kick this off with an unsolved serial killer, just because I find them so fascinating. Someone can go around killing numerous people and no one knows who it is. And still, to this day, don't know who it is. Baffling. So I'm gonna talk about today the alphabet murders. Dun dun dun! Dun dun dun! Yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Also, before I go any further, I just want to quickly say as well that there will be a warning to this video. Some viewers may find the following content highly disturbing and controversial. Viewers' discretion is advised. So, I'm going to take you guys back to the 70s. My parents lived it. It seemed like a great time, to be quite honest. So what was in? Flared trousers, crazy shift printed dresses, hair that was so big, there's absolutely no reason for it other than the fact it was fashionable. 70s disco music, we all love it, I still love it. You know, Saturday Night Fever, ABBA, Elton John, bit of Blondie, we're there. I've set the scene, Apollo 13 happened. We managed to get a geezer on the moon. 70s was a time. Now I'm gonna take you to USA. We are in the state of New York. I'm gonna kick this off right from the beginning of this story. Um, and I'm gonna start you off with 16th of November, 1971. And we're in Rochester. Right, I'm, I'm gonna say it's Rochester just because I'm a Brit, but you know, it might not be. So a 10 year old Puerto Rican girl has moved to Rochester with her family. Her name is Carmen Colon. I'm gonna say Colon, it might not be right. And she disappeared while returning from the pharmacy to pick up a prescription for her grandmother. So Carmen left the store learning the prescription that she'd gone to pick up for her grandmother wasn't ready, wasn't processed. And she then informed the owner of the store that she had to go, had to, had to go, like I've got to go. This girl, by the way, is 10. So this is welcome to the 70s, you know, you've got children running errands, going out by themselves. Is this okay? I mean, who knows at this point? She was like, I've got to go, I've got to go. She must have been in a hurry. Where was she going? You know, she only set out on this journey to go get her grandmother's prescription. So that's already for me a red flag. Then an eyewitness report saw Carmen getting in to a car which appeared to be waiting for her outside the pharmacy. This is also questionable because as far as we are aware, she set off by herself, walking. She's a 10 year old, she can't drive. Another red flag. So about 50 minutes after she was last seen at the pharmacy, a group of motorists spotted a girl that looked exactly like Carmen along the Interstate 490, which I'm assuming is a bit like a highway or like a motorway, naked from the waist down, running from a reversing vehicle. So imagine just driving past that, you're on the motorway and there's a child naked from the waist down running away from the car on the side of the motorway. And the car was believed to be Ford Pinto hatchback in a dark color. I'll put 
picture up as well. So she was frantically like waving her arms and shouting and trying to get the attention of the people driving past, trying to flag down a vehicle to collect her, to pick her up, to save her. Nobody, standard 70s, stopped for her. Nobody. I mean, I understand it's probably slightly off-putting driving past that in your car when you're just trying to get from A to B, but like, I'd like to think if I was in that situation I'd stop if it's a child, do you know what I mean? Anyway, an eyewitness report then said that they saw Carmen getting led back to the car by a man, and you know, that was that. No one blinked an eyelid at that. That was the last time that Carmen was seen alive. So, two days later, so this is now the 18th of November, 1971. A couple of teenage boys were walking through Churchville, and you know, they were just, wandering around, obviously most probably trying to cause trouble because that's what teenage boys do. And Churchville is a very small city just on the outskirts of Rochester. So they came across what they thought, what they thought was a half naked mannequin in a ravine not far from the interstate 490 exit. It was not a mannequin. No, it wasn't. It was the body of Carmen. The location that she was found was approximately 12 miles away from when she was last seen alive. After some inspection, Carmen had been raped and she had a fracture to her skull and to her vertebrae. She had then been strangled to death. And we are assuming that the, the ligature marks that she was strangled by hand, not with anything. Her body was also discovered covered in scratches. Carmen's underwear was found near the exit of the Interstate 490. What pisses me off is that there were so many eyewitnesses to this, to her disappearance, and nobody felt the need to like, just check up on the situation, you know, pull on up and be like, oh, sorry little girl, you look in distress. Do you know this man? Do you need help? No one felt that that needed to be done because this girl would maybe still be alive, do you know? So, there were no real clues at the scene to sort of get an idea of who the, the suspects could be. At one stage, they did believe that Carmen's uncle was involved in Carmen's murder, only because of the fact that Carmen was comfortable to get into the car with this man, which leads investigators to assume she knew him. I mean, that gives off uncle vibes, for sure. I'm with them on that one, 100%. If my uncle offered to give me a lift, I'd take it. Her uncle is called Uncle Miguel, by the way. So Uncle Miguel, soon after the killing of Carmen, he ended up fleeing back to Puerto Rico. Concerned, suspicious, interesting. So this automatically did make him look slightly suspicious. But not long after, he was found and he'd committed suicide as he'd killed his wife and his brother-in-law before shooting himself. That's also suspicious behaviour, but apparently he killed his wife due to a domestic dispute. He was having an argument with her, so apparently it had nothing to do with Carmen's disappearance, but you know, who knows. So, a few months later, we're now in 1972, Rochester decided that they needed to find who killed Carmen and they needed to speak more to the public. So they decided to put up eight foot billboards in and around Rochester that basically said, do you know who killed Carmen? And they were everywhere, basically hoping that anyone who was visiting or if anyone knew anything, it would sort of make them want to come forward. But unfortunately, nothing came from using these billboards. They had so many calls, but nothing that was really standing out to them to be something to do with Carmen's murder. That is the story of Carmen. Carmen Cologne, Churchville. It's just a coincidence at this point. Then, 17 months later, on the 2nd of April, 1973. 11-year-old redhead Wanda Walkowitz. Walkowitz. I'm gonna go with Walkowitz, but we're just gonna refer to her as Wanda because I can pronounce that a lot easier. So she was only a year older than Carmen at 11. 
and she disappeared while returning home from collecting some groceries for her mother. So according to the owner of the store that Wanda visited, she did come in, she did collect her mum's groceries and she did leave. Several neighbourhood residents did say that they saw Wanda struggling with her grocery shopping, like her food shopping bag for her mum. And you know, they drove past and whatever, didn't offer her a lift because they saw she was struggling. Also, three of her classmates from school also saw her bracing the shopping bag against the fence to sort of get a better grip of the handles as well. So there was a lot of people who saw her and no one thought anything of it or considered to help. Welcome to the 70s, everyone. These school children also saw that a brown vehicle was slowing past as, as it was driving past Wanda. That was the last time Wanda was seen alive. So Wanda's fully clothed body was then found, left alongside a road in Webster, New York, which is also a small town, small village. The position of her body when the police found it were giving off the vibes that she was thrown out of a moving vehicle, which is just heavy stuff, you know. <sighs> Can't even imagine being those police officers finding that. So despite the fact her body was fully clothed, an autopsy then revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and there was traces of semen and pubic hair on her body. Then she must have been strangled with some form of ligature. Um, investigators believe it to be a belt. There were also several defensive wounds on her body where she's obviously trying to fight back to her attacker. Then what also fucked me up slightly is her body had been redressed after she was murdered. So that's a bit weird and makes me slightly uncomfortable. Also several strands of white cat hair was also found on her clothes, even though Wanda and her family didn't own a white cat or any animal with white fur. Interesting. Keep that to one side, okay? An eyewitness then came forward and informed investigators that they saw Wanda when she was walking home with her mum's shopping, that they saw her leaning over into a car window as if she's like leaning on it, talking to the driver. It's a large brown vehicle, but nobody could see the driver's face. The Rochester Police Department and investigators dismissed any suggestion of linking the murders of Carmen and Wanda. They believed that they weren't the same person that was doing it, even though the sheriff's sergeant of the police department assigned Carmen's investigator also to Wanda's case. Hmm. I personally believe they just didn't want to freak everyone out at this point. I feel like they were like, let's not tell them there's a serial killer because we don't want them freaking out and thinking that their kids are not safe. Let's let them, you know, let their kids out still, even though there could be a serial killer on the loose, you know. There's nothing wrong with that at all. So that is Wanda's story. We're now gonna move seven months later after Wanda's story to Michelle Mayenza. I think on the 6th of November 1973 Michelle was reported missing by her mother after she failed to return home from school you know it's not that's not what she was like at all she was a really well behaved kid she wouldn't just stay late and not tell her mum do you know what I mean so that expressed some cause for concern for her mum which is fair enough so Michelle was last seen by her classmates walking alone en route to a shopping centre to pick up a bag or, or like a purse that her mum had left behind during the day that day she was just going to collect it for her mum and the shopping centre was really not that far from the school, so it was it was going to be a super quick pickup before she headed home. So about 10 minutes later after her classmates saw her, a witness saw Michelle in the front passenger seat, beige tan sort of vehicle, crying her eyes out as this car sped away. So that same day, but now later on into the evening, a guy in his car saw a beige tan dark vehicle with a flat tire just outside the town of Woolworth, holding a girl he strongly believed to be Michelle by the wrist. When this motorist has stopped, you know, he pulled over, he was like, that girl looks like she's, you know, in trouble. I'm gonna pull over and just check and see maybe the guy might need a hand with his flat tire. You know, this, this motorist stopped 
legend. When the motorist stopped to offer assistance to the man, the man had deliberately stepped in front of the license plate of his car and grabbed the girl and pushed her behind his back. This guy then stared at this motorist with such a threatening expression that the motorist felt that he had to just leave the situation and he left Michelle there with the man but he feels awful. Two days later, Michelle's fully clothed body was discovered lying face down alongside a rural road in Mayston. So when they did the autopsy on Michelle's body, they found that not only did she have some serious blunt force trauma to her head, she had also been raped and sexually assaulted, then strangled to death with some form of ligature. Investigators believe it could have been some rope. Investigators were able to get a partial palm print from her neck and also there were numerous strands of white cat hair also found upon Michelle's clothing. So there are some similarities now between the other cases, especially Wanda's case and Michelle's. So this is now leading to investigators to realise they do have a serial killer on their hands. So there's also some analysis of Michelle's stomach content. There was a cheeseburger in her stomach at the time, which was consumed approximately an hour before she was killed. So this murderer was feeding her as well. But this had also given credibility to an eyewitness report that had come into the station. A Caucasian male, dark hair between the ages 25 to 35, around six foot tall, Michelle and this man were in a fast food restaurant in the town of Penfield around an hour or so before her death. So this has finally allowed the investigators to get a sketch or something for them to find what this guy looks like. So a sketch was done and it didn't really look like anyone that was someone they've seen before or had committed a previous crime. So it didn't really bring much. No one had stepped forward to say that the sketch looked like anyone. It seemed to have been a pretty dead end. So there were definitely similarities between all three of these murders. All three girls' first name and surname began with the same letter. All three were of a similar age, 10 to 11. All three were from Catholic families. All three had struggled with their studies at school. All three girls were also from poorer neighbourhoods. And also their murders seem to have had quite a lot of common factors too. So all their bodies were found in rural areas. All three were in some way sexually assaulted and raped and they all died from strangulation, which is just, ugh, I don't know how investigators do it, having to compare these sort of situations. It's just awful. And all three girls were discovered in a city or a village or a town that matched the letters of their name. So we had Carmen Cologne, who was found in Churchville. We had Wanda Wolkowitz, who was found in Webster. And we also had Michelle Menenza, that was found in Mayston. And this is where he then got his name as the Alphabet Killer. Let's briefly talk about some suspects. So I'd already spoken to you guys and told you about Carmen's uncle, who was considered a suspect. Nothing really came of that, but then once Wanda and Michelle's murders happened, they were then able to connect more people as they sort of had more evidence, they had more to go off of. I just went away to put my lashes on. Okay, so where are we? So, one of the strongest suspects is a man called Dennis Termini and he was a 25 year old Rochester firefighter. Couldn't be any more fucked up. Who was supposed to look after you and make sure you're safe and it could be the, this guy who killed these really young girls. So it's just, it's very fucked. I'm gonna call him Dennis because I can't really pronounce his last name. But so Dennis was already a well-known serial offender and was known as the garage rapist. Like, could this get any more disturbing? So he was known to have a minimum of 14 rapes and sexual assault on teenage girls and young women between the years of 1971 and 1973. So he was around and could potentially have done this to these girls. And to be honest, it seems pretty legit to me. 
it sounds like as if it just went wrong and he didn't intend to kill them or whatever and it just he realized he got away with the first one and could potentially get away with the rest of them i feel like that is a pretty strong contender he was also known to have had a beige tan car at a similar time he's also known to live at a nearby address to the area where michelle had been seen alive they had no strong evidence to tie Dennis to the alphabet murders and so they weren't really able to pursue that angle which is very frustrating. What also is extremely suspicious is five weeks after the final killing of the alphabet murders which was Michelle he abducted another victim although on this occasion he was actually pursued by the police and this then led to Dennis committing suicide. Red flag, serious red flag. To me, it sounds like it could have been him, but then he could have committed suicide because he didn't want to get caught for the rapes that he was already pursuing, not necessarily that he was guilty for the alphabet murders. So it's really tricky. They had no evidence to support that it was him other than the fact he was already a serial rapist. And also then did some forensic experiments on Dennis's car and they found that on the inside of the car he did actually have traces of white cat hair in the upholstery. Coincidence? I mean it could be. It could be. So we then get a skip forward to January 2007 while we're talking about Dennis. By 2007 DNA testing was fully in swing. It was a very, and it still is, a very, very helpful tool. Dennis's body was exhumed and they did a DNA test comparison of the semen samples recovered from Wanda's body against Dennis's DNA and the DNA test results came back negative so Dennis was not responsible for Wanda's murder. It's just at the point now where you just want it to, to be him because it just it then has the answer to everyone's questions. And at least you can pinpoint it and blame it on someone and I just think it's the worst when you can't. So then one of the other possible suspects is one of the Hillside Stranglers, Kenneth Bianchi. Bianchi? So Kenneth was a, I believe, an ice cream vendor. Like, come on. If that was any more of a serial killer job. So he was, he was known to have worked in locations around Rochester, which would put him in a very prominent position. He was also relocated from Rochester to Los Angeles between 77 and 78. He and his cousin Angelo committed all the Hill Hillside Strangler murders, 10 girls and young women between the ages of 12 and 28. So Bianchi was never charged of the alphabet murder and he denied any involvement in it at all. So the last possible suspect was a guy called Joseph Nazo. So he was a 77 year old. He was arrested in Reno, Nevada. Sorry. So this was a 77 year old man who was arrested in Reno, Nevada for murdering four women between 1977 and 1994. There were similarities between his four victims as well. All four women were sex workers and their surnames began with the same first letter as their first name, also coming out to be the California alphabet murderer. But the murders were made in California, but he was arrested in Nevada. Sorry if that wasn't very clear. So same concept, but just in a different state. Coincidence? Maybe, maybe not, who knows. So they then did a DNA test on Nazo to see whether his DNA matched the sperm DNA. Unfortunately, his DNA did not match. I can't even imagine how frustrating that must be. So Nazo was then brought to trial for the California alphabet murders and he was then convicted of all four of those California murders and was sentenced to death. So at least one tragic serial killer's out of the way, but it's not the answer we wanted for our story. Just quickly show you my makeup. I mean, I think it's cute. I rushed the lip, but it's fine. 
So guys, that is the end. The police still believe that the killer of the three girls is still out there and alive. And with Wanda's case being the only one with any form of usable DNA, there's still so many unanswered questions. Um, I personally believe Dennis Terramini, Terramini, the first suspect that I spoke about could actually have been him. Um, he had a white cat, he had a brown tannish looking car that was seen at one of the murders. He was already, it was around, he was doing horrible shit anyway. I just feel like answers a lot of my questions but also didn't match with his DNA test. So uh, I don't really know but it's it's mind-boggling that there's so many unsolved murders and cases and serial killers that are still out there. I personally find this one fascinating, just with the whole alphabet concept as well. I don't know, I, I'm i really stuck with this one. I think it must be Dennis. I'd love to hear your guys' opinion in the comments down below. Who do you think it is? If you enjoyed my Serial Killer Sunday and you want me to do more Serial Killer Sundays, I have them lined up, ready to go. I've got one ready that I can do for you guys. It's very, very heavy and I mean, I'd love to talk about it, but it's entirely up to you guys. If you love this video, please give it a like, comment, I will also leave the links to where I got all my information from my story today in the description below if you want to do some reading yourself and I will link all the products that I've used in today's video down below as well. Guys, thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next week.